Finally, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Frederick Lewis. Uh, Professor Lewis studied bioengineering and obtained a PhD at Rye University in Brussels, where he has continued his career with the Industrial Microbiology and Food Biotechnology Research Group. He is a professor in food science and biotechnology with a particular focus on animal product technologies. And he is very well qualified to provide an international insight into some of the challenges facing red meat. Professor Lewis, welcome. Good morning, and um, thank you so very much for welcoming me in wonderful New Zealand. Um, I do have a lot of ground to cover this morning, so I will go straight to the heart of the matter with <coughs> this uh, painting by a compatriot of mine from Belgium, René Magritte. He's a surrealist painter, and you may have seen this one. Ceci n'est pas une pipe. This is not a pipe. But let me transfigure this for you today to the following. Ceci ne sont pas des aliments. These are not foods. Because <clears throat> there is indeed something rather surreal about the way we look at food today. Now this is food for most people. And I suppose that most people would also say this is very nutritious food. Quality protein, packed with micronutrients. And yet, some would present the future of food as this. This is egg produced by the company Just. And if you read the label, <coughs> you will see that this product is not only free of cholesterol, it's also free of egg. So this is egg-free egg. <laughs> it's also plant-based, but there are not a lot of plants to be seen on the label. You will find mostly water, protein isolates, refined oils, and a very long list of additives to be able to texture it, structure it, preservatives, and so on. It's rather extraordinary. This is the topic of today, food as well. I hope to say, and this will be according to most people. So most people will still say that this is food, and I believe that most people will still say this is good food. And yet, as you know, the future of food looks like this. This is the Beyond Burger, and if you look at the, the, the ingredient list, you will find mostly the same types of ingredients as on the slide before. You have water, protein isolate, refined oils, and a long list of additives. So you may say this is basically the future of food according to a minority. A loud minority, but a minority nevertheless. Nevertheless, I do worry, because this narrative now <coughs> is also being endorsed by high-level policymakers. This is a tweet uh, from the official account of UN Environment. And let me read it to you. Warning, no meat was used in the following video. Cutting back on meat is an essential part of preventing the degradation of our environment. And then the most worrying part is that mainstreaming meatless burgers benefit businesses, consumers, and our planet. <coughs> now, in this video, in this tweet, <coughs> you'll have an... Uh, you have a video that goes with this, and I took some snapshots from that video. <clears throat> and you can see that in 2018, uh, Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods have been proclaimed champions of the earth by UN Environment. Okay? So we have just seen Beyond Meat. Impossible Foods is a very similar company, probably you'll know it. And its company statement, its goal, its mission, is to eliminate the need for animals in the food chain by 2035. So uh, let this sink in for a moment. You have an official account of the United Nations basically promoting ultra-processed foods and endorsing an extremist agenda. <clears throat> so at this point, I would like to introduce you to something that I've been using a lot in my papers lately, the concept of the pharmacon. The pharmacon is a philosophical concept um, which was launched by Jacques Derrida in the previous century. It goes back to Plato, but it basically denotes 
any substance that is both harmful and beneficial. So it's a cure and a poison at the same time. You can find it in the, in, in the idea of pharmacy still today. You know, every, every medicine is in some, some way kind of poison. And this is very much the case for meat nowadays. So meat is presented according to its long-standing connotations of, uh, of a nourishing food, something that is really um, important for health, and it has this very, very long tradition of being a health food. And at the same time, another voice within society will say that it will make you sick, it will give you cancer, it will increase mortality. Very surprising. And the concept of pharmacon is very tightly connected to another concept, which has to do with this binary clash between those two concepts, namely the one of pharmakos. Pharmakos is <coughs> Greek for scapegoat. It means various things, but mostly it's scapegoat. And that's what basically is happening today. Meat is getting scapegoated. <coughs> and that is not all that surprising if you know more about the history of meat. Meat is a very, very, it's, it's not like any other food. It's a very symbolic food. It has many symbolic layers, and it's able to absorb a lot of symbolism. It's also able to absorb a lot of anxieties, contemporary anxieties. So we project them easily on meat, whether it be about our own bodies, about the planet, about animal welfare. <clears throat> and the narrative is being propagated by mass media to a large extent. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but The Guardian has been financed uh, with a lot of money by the Open Philanthropy, Pro Philanthropy Project to publish a series called Animals Farmed. And the main goal of this series is to depict animal agriculture as something that is harmful for the planet and for many other things. By the way, OPP is also an investor in Imposs Impossible Foods. Now, last year we published a study in the journal Appetite uh, looking into another major British newspaper, the Daily Mail. <clears throat> and we looked at every single article that has been published between the beginning of the century until 2015. So anything that had to do with meat and health. And we did an in-depth analysis. We don't have the time for this today. <clears throat> but it didn't take long for us to find out that this was not about science. It was about post-truth. So um, the cherry picking and invention of information rather than the facts. And also something called the attention economy. Now the attention economy has to do with the fact that media today, especially mass media, is uh, being financed by advertisers and those will give money according to the amount of clicks you will generate. So media generates clickbait. And to generate clickbait, you will need screaming headlines, sensationalist uh, headlines. This is an example of just, this, just a couple of snapshots of, of, the, of what I've, we found. This is uh, <coughs> an example of what the Daily Mail was putting forward. It's also an example of uh, a pharmacon, basically. This is English breakfast. And the one states that it's uh, the most healthy of all breakfasts. And the other article within the same newspaper will say that it will give you cancer and it's one of the worst things you can eat. So how not to confuse the public? And you may say that this is a Daily Mail and it's a sensationalist newspaper in the first place, but it hasn't always been like this to the same extent. We saw in our study that in the first years of the century, uh, the information was still rather moderate. For instance, in 2006, we had this title, Red Meat Can Raise Cancer Risk. Fair enough. You can have a debate. This is what, you know, this is, it's a very moderate title. Also, the length of the titles was much shorter. They, they started to explode after, so after 2006, 2007. And you will, at the end, you will uh, see titles such as the ones on the right, uh, such as why feasting on steak makes it difficult for men to father a child, it makes their sperm slow. That's <laughs> an entirely different title than the one I just showed you before. And many other ones, you see them there. In, in, the, um, in the actual article, if somebody's interested, I can send it to you, you'll find lots of other examples. But one which is particularly important is the one at the bottom. So let me zoom into that one. Um, bacon, burgers, and sausages are a cancer risk, say World Health Chiefs. And then they link red meat and processed meat 
to, uh, to cancer and to cigarettes, and they compare it with cigarettes and asbestos and all kinds of extremely dangerous substances. And this, of course, refers to the IRC WHO report, making the link between red meats, processed meats, and colon cancer. It's, this is, of course, not what the report is saying, but this is what the Daily Mail makes of it. We'll come back to this in a, later, in, later in the presentation. Uh, but I want to draw your attention to the following point. World Health Chiefs. And that's important because this brings in authority. And authority is a major problem here. Because authority is something that is difficult to deal with. Uh, appeal to authority is a logical mistake, but you, you, if you're a scientist, it's very hard to contextualize because people refer always to the authority. This is the, this is the Flemish food pyramid. So from my home country, Belgium, in the Flemish part, we use this as a food pyramid. They, for some reason, they put it upside down. <laughs> uh, but what I want to show you is that at the very bottom of the pyramid, you will find red meat, even below butter. Um, well, it's in the same compartment anyway. Uh, it is still allowed. There's a little smiley next to it. It doesn't look all that happy. Yeah? So you're allowed to have a, just a little bit of that. And uh, you will also see a red circle next to the pyramid. Now, in this circle, they have excommunicated all foods you're not supposed to eat. And that includes bacon, ham, uh, any sort of processed meat. So whatever you did with fresh meat ends up there. And basically, this states that processed meats, such as bacon or salami or anything else, is equal to candy to crisps, to soda, to alcohol. Now, I've, been, I've published an, art, an, um, an article in a peer-reviewed journal with several other scientists just to say why I don't agree with this approach. But that's where it stays, because you're facing authority. And the author authoritarian push is getting stronger with the month. Of course, probably most people here will know this one. This is from the Eat Lancet Commission, the Planetary Health Diet which they portray as a great food transformation with capital letters and uh, is mostly a semi-vegetarian diet. It also allows for, allows for a vegan and a vegetarian option, as long as you take B12 together with the vegan interpretation. And uh, if you look at that diet, you will see that you're allowed to eat more sugar. You're not allowed to eat all that much sugar, but makes it even worse, you're eat, al allowed to eat more sugar than you are allowed to eat any of those animal products. Uh, you can have one and a half egg a week, you can have seven grams of beef and lamb per day. Uh, so this is a very, very extreme diet, however they talk about it. And I have many issues with this diet. And I will not go into everything here. I've written down a lot of my criticism in this article together with Martin Cohen which you can find on the internet on the FN News website. But one of my main concerns is also is how this initiative is working together with the major uh, food multinationals in a way that um, all those big food producers, and you can basically, basically say all of them, are really uh, happy to take up this vegan, uh, vegan product lines. Uh, PepsiCo senior director claims the future is vegan. You know, it's a headline. So these are very remarkable evolutions. So what is happening? You can understand that if you have a grand narrative that you will require solid backers to, to get it uh, going, but why would they do that? Well, such companies are primarily based on growth. They have to keep on growing. They have to please shareholders every so many months. And they have made their impact and their fortunes in the very beginning, in the 20th century, mostly after the 1950s, by offering pleasure, hedonistic pleasure, but also convenience, which at the time was very, very valuable. So they, they grew very fast, they made lots of money with this, but you have to keep on growing. So once you saturate your domestic mar markets, you have to expand, you go global. At some point, you saturate global markets and you, keep, you need to keep on growing. So you'll develop all kinds of new, new products, food innovation, uh, and, and you'll use lifestyle quite a lot to be able to position those products. But where you go next? Huh? Because all those big multinationals are 
at the end ending up in, in, a, in a, almost an oligarchy of about five, six, seven of them. So they will need something else. And there's this very elegant solution that if you can use cheap materials, the cheapest possible, and you can still ask high prices, that would be fantastic. <laughs> How do you add the value? Well, through processing, and that's their core business. Changing cheap primary materials and making something new with it through processing and connecting it to storytelling, which is basically another name for marketing. This is a sector they rather not work with all that much. It's a very difficult sector. It has been a great model for the food industry in the past, but nowadays it's a very difficult one. You'd have to deal with animal welfare, with farmers, you have, to, you have small margins, you have um, limited processing options, so it's not an ideal solution. If you can get rid of that, why not? But you will have to make, of course, a huge transition. Um, because with bioreactors and with all kinds of high-tech, quick-fix kind of approaches, at the end you will have a product that has to please the consumer or they will never make this transition. So what you do, you promise a lot. You promise purity, health, progress, redemption. And you have to create capital. You have to create economic capital, cultural capital, very important, and scientific capital, if you want to make that happen. And this is not new. We've been there before. If you remember the margarine story, margarine was created upon request of Napoleon III to create a substitute butter for the poor classes, for the, for the army. Now, if in the 19th century you would have come up with an imitation of butter, people would have refused it. Butter was a real thing. You don't come up with a cheap substitute. And yet, at some point in time, especially because patents were taken and major companies got behind it, margarine became better than butter. So the substitute became better than the real thing. And how did he do that? Exactly as I showed in the slide before. Creating scientific capital, that came a bit later, but with Ansel Keys and the lipid heart theory. Um, creating an idea of progressive appeal, because margarine was connected to the feminist movement. It was new, it was modern, it was made in labs, it was clean, it was progressive. <coughs> and on the very right, you see commercial for margarine. And look, look what it writes. So they say new margarine discovery. Discovery is important. It's something it's scientific and it's new. It's high tech. And it looks like, it cooks like, and it tastes like butter. Right? And I'll show you something surprising. This is the Beyond Burger vegan patty. It looks, cooks, and tastes just like beef. It is the same thing. It is a copy paste of what happened with the margarine story. So, of course, if, you, if you're going to try to impose such a diet to the planet, because it's designed for every citizen on the planet, it's a global, it's, it's a planetary diet. People will not just go for that unless you force it upon them. And that's actually what the report states. So, the scale of change to the food system is unlikely to be successful if left to the individual or to the whim of consumer choice. So what do they do? They, they seek assistance uh, with different allies and partners. And one of them is the World Resources Institute. Now, the World Resources Institute has come up with something called the shift wheel. Now, the shift wheel is something they have taken from, from marketing and from private, private marketing. And it involves such things as disguising the change, so slow process, um, make certain foods so socially unacceptable, others acceptable, create new markets, constraint display, and all sorts of things. And uh, WRI has also um, produced this scheme in their report where they have a range of possible interventions, going from the soft range to the hard range. For instance, playing with the display of you know, vegan um, products in, 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 the, in the meat retail part, uh, or uh, modifying nutritional labeling, dietary guidelines, and basically what Eat Lancer Eat Lancet considers as its major victory is the Canadian guidelines, the new Canadian guidelines. If you look at the new Canadian guidelines, look at the, at the dish, you see a lot of reflection of the Eat Lancet diet. Now, at this, at this very moment, there's a lot of debate in Canada 
about uh, about this diet, and the conservative conservatives have come come out and say that this is a a biased approach, and they want to see it changed. So it will be interesting to see what happens in the future. They also propose to have 30-day uh, challenges. You all know these vegan challenges for uh, veganery or, or meatless may and all those kind of things. These are quite soft, but then it gets more um, <clears throat> more worrying, of course, if you will have if you start start talking heavy taxes. We're not talking about small taxes; we're talking about heavy taxes. And this is also very much endorsed by the Eat Lancet Commission. You see on the right Professor Willett from Harvard, and below him you see Marco Springman, Dr. Springman from Oxford. And they're both advocating um, taxes and us getting away from red meat uh, to prevent a third of early deaths, according to Professor Willett, and to save, and, and, and the same thing for, for Dr. Springman, but also to save the planet. And you, you see this one from Oxford today, what if we all turned vegan by 2050? So this is on the table, and um, it, it can also be reflected in ideas about banning meat altogether. Um, this is a report, a recent report, headline report from C40 Cities. So C40 Cities is, I don't know if you, uh, if you know this initiative, but it's, it's also a formal partner of EAT. They, they work together on many, on many points. And they, in their report, they have set two uh, targets for 2000, I can't read it here, I think it's 2030, um, re to reduce the amount of meat populations eat per person per year to 16 kilos, kilograms, and dairy to 90. And in their more ambitious target, they have reduced that to zero. So this is in actual reports designed by policy people. So don't underestimate the potential impact of these kind of things. And um, also with these examples, uh, New York's major, Bill de Blasio, has endeavored to reduce uh, beef purchases uh, by the city to, uh, by 50%, and he wants to phase out all processed meats. So he wants to get rid of that. Um, introduce Meatless Mondays in public schools. Christina Figueres, which is the architect of the, of the Paris Climate Agreements, so she's a high level policymaker. She has said at some point that she would prefer to see meat eaters get out of the restaurants, to ban them from the restaurants. If they want to have their steaks, they can have them outside, like the smokers. <laughs> That's an actual quote. And uh, below that, is a, there's, an, there's an, an article sponsored, a uh, scientific article sponsored uh, by the Wellcome Trust, which is also financing Eat Lancet, by the way. Um, it's, so it's an academic article um, arguing for a legal ban on animal products. So just legally ban all animal products. It's an intellectual uh, exercise, but nevertheless very worrying because it's being discussed. So is this all is justified? These are very, very extreme measures. Are they justified for the planet? Are they justified for our health? Now, I may not have time to finish all, all the slides I have, but let's, let's start and, and see what, where it brings us. Um, <clears throat> This is an, uh, a snapshot from Twitter, uh, a reply of Professor Michael Mann, uh, director of the Earth Systems Science Center from Penn State University. He's a very important climate scientist. And he replied to a tweet that was saying that the best thing you can do for the planet is just to go vegan. And uh, you know, it's the general narrative that uh, the cows, they were on the cars. And Professor Mann basically said, that's a myth. That's a myth, it's uh, meat eating is a modest slice of the whole emission pie. And uh, the major problem, th the actual problem, is fossil fuel burning. So let's see what that, what that is about. Um, let's start looking at the emissions of, a, of an individual. What would be your personal footprint? And that's variable, of course. You have countries like the USA that produce quite a lot, and you have India, which is at the bottom of the graph. Uh, the EU is somewhere in the middle. So let's, let's take something at this level, for instance. 12 tons of CO2 equivalents per person. And that's the actual emission also of the average Frenchman. And it breaks down to this overview. So you have all kinds of contributions. Uh, you also have for comparison what the impact is of avoiding a flight transatlantically or to live car free. So that, can, that varies, of course, on the kind of car you have, etc. What is the impact of diet? Well, the impact of diet is on the very right. Uh, you can shift from an omnivore diet to a vegan diet, 
to a vegetarian diet or to a flexitarian diet. And that will give you a certain percent of reduction. But it's not all that much as people often say. They often say it's the largest thing you can do or it will halve your footprint. It is within the diet compartment that will make changes. Within your overall footprint, it's quite modest. And uh, so, so going vegan maybe will give you 6%. But if you take into account rebound effects, some will argue that it will even be less. You will have to halve that more or less. Um, so basically, the impacts of going plant-based exists, of course, but it is not the numbers you often see. It is something in the range of 1% to 6%, wherever you want to put it. And this is also the, the order of magnitude you will find if you go from the micro level to the macro level. If you look at the macro, this is data for the United States. If the whole of the United States would go vegan, the difference would be 2.6%. And uh, a Meatless Monday initiative would be something like 0.3%. But moreover, in, in the paper by White and Hall, where they have looked at, where they have modeled this substitution, they also see that you will end up with deficiencies in essential nutrients. So is this the price you're willing to pay for your country? And it's not surprising to have this kind of low numbers. If you, if you know that livestock represents about 4% of the total pie, and that transportation is somewhere at 29%, electricity 28%, industry 22%. So basically, the elephant in the room here is fossil fuels, no doubt about it. And media is focusing on the diet, scapegoating. The example for, for my, again, my, my home country, this, well, this is the, at least the Flemish part of it, in Flanders, there is a single steel factory that produces more greenhouse gas emissions than the whole of agriculture combined. So not even livestock, the whole of agriculture combined. Nobody talks about this company in the news. But there are many stories about going vegan. It's a point of reference. This is Brussels Airport. Doesn't matter so much. So <clears throat> the question is, is livestock and the derived products, are they being used as scapegoats? Because there's so many other things to deal with. Cement industry. When are we talking about cement industry? But it represents 7% of the global emissions. Uh, global tourism, 8%, ever increasing. ICT, especially mobile phones, are expected, as if things, it's a bit, of course, it's a debatable number, but they may go up to 14% of, of the total emissions in, in uh, <clears throat> a couple of decades. Food waste, of course, well, to be fair, that's, that's often on the table. Uh, but also pets, pet food. Um, it is said that maybe one fourth of, or the total animal production impact may be related to pet food, in, to pet feed in, in the US. Uh, and interestingly, this is a study from, uh, from Switzerland, where they show that having a horse, for instance, is one third of your, of your personal impact is the same as having a horse. And uh, nobody's arguing against that, and I don't say you should. And actually, the conclusion in the slide there is, is a quite good one. So they're, they're saying that. Yes, there is an impact of having pets in Switzerland, of course, but it is low. It's not all that substantial. So we shouldn't really, it's not a critical issue, they say. We shouldn't really worry all that much about this compared to all the other things. And it's exactly the same situation as for, as for the diet. But for pets, they contextualize it. For the diet, they don't. So if, if a vegan advocate comes up and says, uh, you should change your diet immediately to save, you know, to save the planet, well, Ask them if they have a smartphone, if they go for holidays, if they have pets, and then compare those numbers and see where you end. <coughs> so the slogans are all over the place. Slogans <coughs> and abuse of metrics. This is a classic one. Cows being worse than cars. They refer to the FAO reports, of course. But they, there are several issues with this. Um, and let me go briefly to all that. But <coughs> for, first of all, life cycles are compared with direct emissions, and you cannot compare you know, you have to compare apples with apples, and then you will see that this is not the case. So this, this is a whole debate. Let me go through that. But also the fact that this 14.5%, which I often cite, well, sometimes you will see 50% or, or the old 18%, but 14.5% is a global number. It's masking a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, and there's a discrepancy between the West, which is gradually improving, as you have in New Zealand. You see that every year you're getting better. You're reducing impact. Developing countries are increasing their impact. You see on this, uh, I don't know if I can, can I do this? Well, you see on the graph below, um, the red zones. 
Now, India, for instance, look on the graph on the right, you will see that India is, a, is the number one emitter, but with less than one kilogram of beef, of beef per person per year because of all the sacred cows they have. So there is a lot of potential, a lot of room on a global level to improve the state of affairs. But they will always use global numbers or the worst case scenarios and apply them on the countries that are functioning rather well. Um, <coughs> the third point is, of course, the, uh, the fact that all, everything is lumped together in this CO2 equivalence, whereas, as you know, methane and CO2 are fundamentally different gases with different kinetics. You have the natural carbon cycle versus the fossil fuels that come after millions of years being stored on the ground, they just released in the atmosphere. And every unit you will burn will contribute to global warming. This is very different. These are two very different situations, and they're lumped together in CO2 equivalents. <coughs> so the rest of the slide, I think most of you will be aware. <coughs> they overlook often the, the sequestration part. Um, the uh, equilibrium is often assumed, whereas sequestration can be substantial. Now, there's interesting work by Jason Roundtree and, and his group, for instance, that where, you show, where they show that you can actually get net carbon sinking if you apply certain types of, of, um, of livestock uh, management, uh, as they have recently done for white oak pastures, for instance. You see there how the sequestration and the building of soil offsets the emissions. Um, and grasslands are just fantastic carbon sinks. Uh, there's one article that states that they, they may be more reliable and more robust than forests, especially in, in regions like California, we have, we have the fires. So they're underground, they're stable, they're, they're very robust and important carbon sinks. And a fifth point, which is very important here, is, the f is of course that if you start comparing transitions and diets, you would have to do that on a fair ba basis. Um, and, and uh, foods with high emissions can give a completely different picture if you take into account nutritional value. Because often you see it expressed per kilogram, per kilocal, etc. You have to see also how much food, how much nutrition those things bring. This is an example where they have taken into account protein quality. And you see uh, with the red bars how the emissions would be if you would just look at quantities. Right? And then if you would take into account protein uh, levels, you would shift to the yellow bars. And then things start changing. If you, if you also take into account essential amino acids, you'll get, end up with the green bars. And you suddenly see how very drastic changes occur. And this is for the emissions. You can have the same kind of situation if you look at land use. You see the beans here coming up a lot. Um, and of course, this is a bit... Uh, one-dimensional because we also have to take into account mixtures of plants and so on to be fair but still it shows that nutrition is changing the picture quite a bit and this is just taking into account essential amino acids if you would to go to the actual true reliable estimates of protein quality you would have also to factor in uh, digestibility etc and this is really changing also the uh, status of plant protein quality so many plant proteins nowadays that can claim to be good protein sources, if you take into account digestibility, these claims often vanish. Uh, so animal source foods are just way superior in the way they deliver protein. And you will really have to combine very um, wisely your plant foods and still it will never be the same thing. What we're facing today is a global challenge. Let's not forget that. We're facing a global challenge to feed the population, not with calories, not with carbohydrates, not with quantities, but with quality protein and with some very um, limiting micronutrients. And that includes uh, iron, vitamin B12, zinc, folate, vitamin A, vitamin, there are many of them. And you need quality diets. And in those quality diets, there's an important place for livestock products. Now, this contextualization, you would, you would need to do that for everything, for water, for biodiversity, for animal welfare. Everything needs to be contextualized. And it's very hard because you often get a slogan and you will have to elaborate on this. I do it now very briefly, um, but you need a lot of elaboration to say why a certain slogan is not true. This is the example for water. The often cited 15,000 liters of water needed for a kilogram of meat, beef, usually. Um, 
but that just doesn't take into account the green water. So they just assume that uh, all water is somehow going to waste, where it's, where, whereas it's rainfall. And, and cows are not ever expanding vats. You know, they're not ever expanding. So this water would fall anyway. And it's not fair to include that in your calculations. You should contextualize it. You can, you can talk, I mean, you can mention them, but you should contextualize them. And you just lump them once more together, as they do with the C2 equivalents. If you look at proper life cycle analysis, people have calculated so some Australian studies. The amount of water is more in the range of five to 500 liters per kilogram of beef. And there's some similar studies you may be aware of for, for, for sheep. And yet, this is what the World Resources Institute once more has shown in its recent report. Um, I had to read this title three times to be realizing what they were actually writing. So th there's, they're stating here that beef and other ruminant meats um, are inefficient sources of calories and protein. So they're saying here that beef is an inefficient source of protein, whereas cattle are net protein producers. They turn the 0.6 kilograms of protein into one. So they're actually upcycling the material. And they're depicted here as being inefficient producers of protein. That's amazing. And why is that? That's because, of course, here they, they express it as um, uh, the, the uh, edible, so sorry, I'm a bit far away, uh, units of <laughs> edible output per, per, per feed. And obviously, if you have beef, they eat grass, they eat lots of grass. And then you will have a number like that. But what are you going to do with the grass? So this is, this is an amazing portrayal of, of the data. And this is also from the same report, where they uh, show beef as being the worst for greenhouse gas emissions and for land use. And that is, of course, based again on kilocal. Um, on the, the, the better ones on the graph would be sugar and palm oil. Just think about it. Is, is this what you want to, want to do? So they completely overlook nutrition. And this is for water, the one I just showed. So the green water versus the blue water. Just, just put the bars together, and you get a very long bar, obviously. Yes. <clears throat> so far, the environment. Let's talk a little bit about health. Uh, well, first, maybe this one. Uh, Professor Mitlerner from UC Davis has put a lot of pressure on the Atlantic Commission to substantiate, substantiate the environmental claims. Because they were say, claiming all kinds of things, especially in the communication more than in the report. And he was really putting the pressure. To, and at some point, the science director of EAT has sent a mail to Professor Mitlerner saying that, uh, well, you can read it there, uh, the diet proposed is, is not set up due to environmental considerations, but it's solely it's, it's, uh, it's only in light of health recommendations. So this is official black and white. Eat Lancet, at least Eat, has stated that their diet is meant for health, not for the environment, whatever they claim. That's not how they portray it, portray it in, in, in the media. And if you look at the health part, I would say it's even worse than the environmental part. Uh, so some people have come out rather quickly, like Dr. Harcombe, uh, and, and others to say that the diet is nutritionally deficient if you would calculate how much nutrients it delivers. And importantly, also, Professor Ioannidis from Stanford has called the health claims in the Eat Lancet diet, has, has labeled them as science fiction. That's a major statement. Uh, so let me skip this one off. Maybe time for this. So let's have some perspective here. We're saying that red meat is an unhealthy food. We've been eating it for over 2.6 million years in substantial amounts. Um, there's a statement here uh, reproduced in a Nature article by Dominguez Rodrigo from Complutense in, in Madrid, uh, saying that by at least 1.5 million years ago, if we wouldn't have had red meat, we would have died. We it was essential to our ancestors. And the people on the left here, the children on the left, are Siberian nomads. That's their staple food. That's what they eat since generations. That's what, that's the food the area provides. So can we go out to those people and say, you're eating the wrong way, you're eating unhealthy food, and you will develop diseases of modernity? No. 
And they are changing their diet, unfortunately. They're adopting the global diets, and they're developing signs of obesity now. And that happened to the Inuit as well. The Inuit, at some point in time, started to adopt Western diets. It was mostly fl uh, flour and sugar and oil and all those kind of things. And they developed diseases. As you know, the Inuit are mostly relying on animal foods. It's, about, it's more than 90% of their, of their intake. And then the West steps in and says, you're eating the wrong way. You're becoming unhealthy. You should change the way you eat. And then they propose this one. It's an igloo with several layers. And if you look at the layers, the bottom of the pyramid is fruits and vegetables. You will see all kinds of things, watermelons, bananas. <laughs> the next level are grains. Talking about the Arctic Circle, don't forget. Then you have dairy and substitutes. And at the top, you will find meat and substitutes. And they're giving it a twist. So they're presenting it as something traditional, whereas it's a Mediterranean diet. It's the Harvard model. It's not even a Mediterranean diet. It's the Harvard interpretation of the Mediterranean diet. And that is a bit what Eat Lancet is doing. They're suggesting diversity and uh, integration in local context, but it's a very rigid, uh, monolithic diet. And it's a very narrow view on nutrition, coming mostly from Harvard. And a good antidote to Western bias is always to go to anthropology. And uh, you, you can, for instance, look at how much Americans, um, how much animal source foods Americans eat. It's about 30% of their diet in scaled on energy intake. Now, if you look at ancestral models of hunter-gatherers, you get somewhere to 68%. And some of them, just the ones we saw before, are almost exclusively animal-based. They did not have the diseases we're talking about today. And something just doesn't add up. These are data on the left for Australia and the right for the US. Red meat consumption has been falling. It has been falling in New Zealand as well. So red meat goes down. Poultry goes up, but red meat goes down. And yet the diseases are increasing. Metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, etc. And if you look on the right side, you will see the red line there is the consumption of red meat from the beginning of the previous century, so the early 1900s, up until today. So it goes up indeed. And then you have the dietary guidelines coming in, the end of the 70s. People follow advice, red meat goes down. And we're back at the levels of the beginning of the 20th century. We're always portraying it as they're having enormous amounts of meat. But we're back at the level of the early 20th century. And at the same time, diabetes is going up. I know it's a bit, it's, you know, you have correlations or not causality and so on. But at least it should make you reflect on, 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 on the matter. So this nutritional dogma, is that robust enough? Is this the thing that we have to deal with? Science has progressed. We know now that it is not about the cholesterol. It's not about all those old school <laughs> Uh, textbook kind of things. It is about inflammation. It's about hyperinsulinemia. I have to skip it because of lack of time here, but it's about those things. It's about broken machines, broken bodies. And those broken machines, machines are generated by the diet for a large part, indeed. And it is the Western diet. But to which degree does that include red meat? Um, the observational data you get to support this is not strong, whatever they say. It's based on flawed data to begin with, food frequency questionnaires. It uh, has a very strong healthy user bias. Lots of confounders, people that eat lots of red meat, behave in very unhealthy ways. Um, and people that are health conscious will not eat a lot of meat because they've been told to do so. So it distorts the data completely. And moreover, the associations are very weak. We're talking about relative risks of, of 1.2 below that. And if you don't have risks that go above the level of, let's say, 2, you have to be very, very careful about what you're saying. On the left, you have a serious risk, elevated visceral fat. That's a broken machine, right? And that gives you a relative risk of about six. That's serious. That's where it's coming from. The one on the right, you can hardly tell if it's due to chance, due to confounding. We just don't know. It's way too weak to, to claim causal relationships. And interestingly, if you take out the... the the Western 
context by looking into other countries or by going global, you see that those associations disappear very often. For instance, the pure studies have uh, inverted the conclusion. There's, they, their result, there's a, it's a global study. It's one of the, the, it's the biggest global study. So many countries are involved. And they have seen that dairy products and meat are beneficially associated with heart health and longevity. So they show the, and that's, of course, it makes sense if you go to developing countries where they're underfed and you feed them quality uh, foods, they will get, be better off. So how strong is this observational evidence? It's sure, certainly not strong enough to make causal claims. You need randomized controlled trials for that. And if you look at the actual intervention studies, you will see that the risk factors are not degrading. They're sometimes even getting better. So there's no, nothing harmful to be measured on the markers. And the observational claims are, are, are way not strong enough. So what are we even talking about? Um, risks are um, exaggerated very often. They talk about 18% risk, which is a relative risk of 1.18. Now, what does, that, what does that mean, 18% risk, which people like to use so often, or 20% or whatever you want? Well, it means going from a risk situation on the, the pie on the left to the pie on the right. You see the little orange part in that? That's the uh, affected population. You see a difference? Almost not. That's because the change is, the absolute risk change is actually 1%. It's explained in this graph, and again, we don't have the time for, to, to go into details, but Absolute risks are the intuitive ones, the one that you need to deal with, that your, your mind needs to deal with. Relative risk doesn't mean all that much. So the, the chance that you will never get uh, colon cancer from eating lots of processed meats in this case is 94% uh, if you don't touch them, and if you eat lots of them, it becomes 93%. So there are all kinds of ways of depicting the information. They just pick the worst way possible. And there is critique including by members of the IRC panel itself. This is Dave Clerfeld from USDA. He's been very, very critical about the whole conclusion. Um, and the same goes for uh, Gordon Guyatt from McMaster's University, uh, stating that WHO has done the public a disservice by communicating the way they did, um, because this is profoundly misleading. Now, these two people on, on, on this slide are very important clinical epidemiologists. They're behind the great quality system. So it's just not any random person saying this. Hazards are confused with risks. A shark is a hazard. Swimming with sharks is a risk. Sunlight is a hazard. Okay? But sunlight also provides you vitamin D. You see the analogy with meat? If you take it in the wrong context, it's harmful. But if you take it in the proper context, it brings you benefit. So if you want to go to risks, you need risk assessment. You need to contextualize, contextualize the diet, the way, you, the way you use the food. And, and there has actually been a risk assessment in, in literature. And their conclusion was the context has been, has been overlooked. And there's not, just not enough sufficient documentation to go to such strong conclusions. And some people even, this is a, it's a very nice article by Bubis et al, uh, where they actually put into question the whole use of IRC kind of evaluations of hazard. What does that actually mean if you don't look at the risk? You're just scaring the public. And you may have trade-offs that are important. Now, if you look at IRC WHO uh, in their report, what do they actually say? If, if you read what their actual statements, they're not as they're often portrayed. You, for instance, there you, you have a conclusion that eating meat has not yet been established as a cause of cancer. This comes directly from WHO. Uh, and the IRC report contains such statements as the importance of chance bias and confounding uh, and the fact that they cannot be ruled out, as I said before. They acknowledge that. Many people within that commission will acknowledge that. And, uh, and yet, it is being abused. So you may indeed wonder, what is the whole purpose of this IRC? What, 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 does, it, what does it bring as an advantage if it is leading to so much um, overstatements and wrong interpretations. So uh, I'm almost finished. Um, I just would, would like to point out this one here still. This is, let's say, a historical overview of our human diets. The, the bottom pyramid would be our very, our, you know, the, the model of our ancestors. For, let's say, 99% of our time on Earth, we've been eating this. A mixture of animal foods and plant foods to variable extents, depending on the ecosystem you were living in. 
And then at a certain moment in time, agriculture came. People started to cultivate grains and pulses. Dairy stepped in also. And um, that depends a bit on your ethnical background. Some people are able to deal with that, others a bit less. But it's still offering you know, good food. Um, and then you have the contemporary additions. Now, why is that that we're trying to draw a line between the plants and the animals? To identify the healthy versus the unhealthy diets, the sustainable versus the unsustainable diets, the ones that are good for animals, the ones that are bad for animals, they all boil down to that same line by coincidence. So how can that line be anything else but the result of symbolism and ideology? There are so many examples of bad practices to be found on the plant side as well. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that everything is fine on the animal side. That's why sometimes you know, these messages are misinterpreted. I'm not advocating here that animal production is completely fine and all is, uh, all is okay. No, there's work to be done. But the same can be said for the plant side. Avocados in Mexico, cashew nuts in India, almonds in California, be it for health or for, or for the environment, there are issues, and also social issues. So beyond meat is just on the good side of the line. But basically, if you would have to cut any part of this dietary overview, I'd say you have to cut this part. You sh should cut along this line, the one that makes sense, not along the symbolic one. So where's the symbolic line coming from? I've been writing extensively about this in several papers, and I'll have to skip this here now, but it has to do with the way we look at food. And this is uh, a process going back to the, to the early days. And it corresponds with our needs, our human needs, biologically and socially. And at the present moment in time, something bizarre has happened. We have turned around all those needs. And we put a lot of focus on the top layer here, the symbolic order, the individual lifestyle kind of need. And this is combined with a moral crisis, which is typical for the West. I, I, I could talk for, for ages about this, but it has to do with the way we're disconnected from the food chain and our whole societal makeup. And these two combined create a very unstable situation. This is another inverted pyramid, like the Flemish one. I think they're wobbly. So yes, to conclude, we are facing a substantial public health crisis. We are facing a threat to our planet. And they're very important, and they're very urgent. And we should do something about it. So no status quo is acceptable. But if we want to change things, we need to do that with the best evidence and narratives are not factual. We shouldn't work with narratives. We should work with facts, rationally. And we should certainly avoid to think in binary and moral categories. We need to stop blaming the farmers. I shouldn't say it here, maybe, but this is my, my general message always in the public. We should stop blaming the farmers and their livestock. Poor animals. And animal source foods. We're blaming the actual steak for being evil and rather integrate them respectfully as part of the solution. They are part of the solution. They're not a the problem, they're part of the solution. You cannot have healthy, sustainable diets without livestock. That's a strong statement, but I actually mean that. We should refrain from scapegoating. Um, and, and because scapegoating is, put, is, is diverting the focus, it's making us look away from the actual priorities. The actual priorities we need to deal with are ultra-processed foods and fossil fuels, excessive burning of fossil fuels. These are our priorities, and they need our full attention. And diverting our attention away from those is going to be harmful. So I'll stop here. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Frederick. Um, you've managed to dislodge the last, last of my nitrous oxide, so... Uh, <laughs> thank you for your talk this morning. Your strong science background in industrial microbiology and food technology has helped us understand 
not only animal product technologies, but human and animal health and well-being and how they all fit together. Uh, I had an experience of the last pocket of resistance perhaps this weekend when I visited my son's flat here in Christchurch. There's 11 of them and they just had a red card the night before so I wouldn't suggest you visit his flat but I would say that there's uh, very little consideration for cancer risk, slow sperm or dangerous substances going on in that flat right now. <laughs> I did a little bit of research, however, and asked them about vegans, flexitarians, meat avoiders, and meat lovers. They thought they were all types of pizza. <laughs> and, and without exception, all ordered the meat lovers, so there's hope yet. Now, we have time for a few questions. Please. Where's that fluffy ball? Can you state your name, please, when you uh, ask your question? Uh, Jeff Grant, thanks for a uh, very interesting presentation in terms of the international trends. I'm just interested in what your thoughts are, what the New Zealand meat industry can do in terms of combating uh, this aspect from a New Zealand perspective, because we are such a minority in terms of uh, the international market in terms of total food consumption. Yes. It's an excellent question, and uh, I'm not going to be able to give you the, the final answer to that. But, um, but certainly, you you will need to, to realize that this is not going away. This is going to stay. What may go away is is the focus on on vegan burgers and the and the millennial lifestyle kind of thing. But this is going to going to stay. So you will need to get <laughs> an act together. Um, I think you will need to be. Factual, certainly. Uh, bring in the science. Keep on uh, having contacts with scientists. Um, using maybe also ni New Zealand as a scientific case study has been done recently quite a bit. Th that's very good, I would say. Using your country as a unique country and using it in scientific case studies. <coughs> you can only win from that. <laughs> if you use the right scientist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> be <coughs> responsible. Don't try to cut corners. Be responsible, I would say. Uh, I know there's a lot of progress being made, but keep on working on things like water quality, biodiversity. Y you're going the right path. S stick to that path, I would say. Uh, and then, of course, is, is the, the point where all those things need to be done. But what is, what is missing, and I'm not talking only about New Zealand, that's a general, a general uh, statement uh, and observation I have. There is a need for more pride, I think. You, this is, these are fantastic products, um, and they should be sensed like that by the public. The public should feel that. They don't feel it anymore. The whole idea of Beyond Burger and those kind of companies is to make meat irrelevant. They're, they, they're not aiming the vegan market. That's way too small. That's 1%, 2%. That's way too small. That's not what they're aiming at. They're aiming at the larger public. They want to give a case where meat and meat imitations are just interchangeable. And if you want to avoid that, well, you have to show that meat is more than that patty. It's all those things. It's all those cultural heritage, all that cultural heritage that we're having. It is actually... Um, it is at the center of our humanity. You have an ex this, is, this is an exceptional food. There's no food like it. Only rice maybe comes a bit close in Asian context, but, or bread in a Christian context, but meat is symbolically and culturally the richest food you can imagine. So you cannot just, they have a difficult mission if they want to replace meat. If, if, if you don't use the assets, they will never succeed. But meat is exceptional in so many ways. And that has to be brought back to the public. The public has forgotten about it. They see a package in the supermarket, a commodity. They don't see meat as our ancestors saw meat anymore. So pride and passion, it is all there, but it has to be brought to the public. Um, and I think what you should try to make them understand is that livestock farmers are not working against nature. They're working with nature. People don't get that. They have to understand that livestock is actually, livestock farming is an alliance with nature. It's in everybody's benefit to keep nature there, to build the soils, to create those, that biodiversity, um, to have those fantastic grasslands. 
And yes, there are things that, going, that are going in the, in, in the wrong direction that should be changed. Uh, you know them, you know your challenges that can be addressed. But the essence is fundamentally beneficial. And you know, I'd say communicate about that and get the science there to show that, to, to back it, but also get people back in touch with it. And not just um, treat meat as a commodity. It is much more than a commodity. Is that answering the question somehow? <laughs> yeah. Lockwood Smith's my name, and congratulations on one of the, I've heard speeches all around the world, and that would be one of the most fascinating addresses I've heard for one hell of a long time. And my own background is in science. My question is this, um, a lone voice in science often has trouble <coughs> breaking through that huge uh, public media barrier you uh, referred to, and it, it is real and, and troublesome. The question is, is there emerging a, a group of scientists like yourself that can compete against some of the, uh, the extremist noise out there from authoritarian outfits like the World Resources Institute because we need that voice. I've just finished reading a book by uh, uh, is it a guy called Pinker, in Enlightenment Now. Mm, it's and Pinker. it's a wonderful, wonderful story of human uh, progress. And, uh, and we need scientists to be heard more clearly. Is there a group of you globally developing along these lines? Yes, there is a group. Uh, it's a, but it is a fragile group. It's a loose group. It's not. This narrative that I've presented today is one backed up by lots of money. It has strong PR. It has networks. It's connected to policymakers. It's, it's all over the place. It's it's a very solid network. Scientists, by definition, almost are a bit disconnected from society because they're locked up in, the <laughs> in, in their laboratories and so on. So they don't, they don't have the training to communicate and they're often poor communicators. Uh, they're often very much specialized in one specific topic. Um, I've noticed that. I'm, uh, to tell you my background, I'm a microbiologist, right? And um, I had to work myself into, nutrition was more easy for me. I had a nutritional background, but the environmental part to me was new. And I had to work myself into it to be able to have the discussion in the first place. Because if you talk about uh, nutrition and you say, look, what you're saying is not correct because of this and this, yes, but it destroys the planet. And then usually the discussion ends. So there are very few people, I think, that are all-rounders. All and as a result, people are not comfortable in one field, they just stay in the back. And there are too few people that are all-rounders and good communicators. So it's a very limited amount of people that start speaking up. But there are a couple. And uh, I think they're all very passionate about it because it's touching the heart of their passion. I mean, it's, it's their passion, basically. Their, the science is what they, they build their careers on the science. And they're, they're passionate about their science. And they see all these distortions. I started to speak up when I felt it was my academic responsibility because there was a lot of silence <coughs> and I felt that I had to do something. And I know that many people would like to do that as well. They may need to be activated and get encouraged and uh, given some confidence because you need confidence also to do this. And uh, yes, so there is, and, and uh, normally I, I expect that there will be a growing resistance to to decompose all, all the misinformation. Because academics, at some point, they want the truth to prevail. It's just that they don't have the gates, they don't have the passage to the access to the public. Because they don't find it easily, and they're not good at, at using that access. So, but it, it, it will come. Uh, just with lower budgets, uh, much more fragmented, disorganized. Uh, these challenges were never there before. They're new. They're, they're, they're maybe since the last eight, eight, seven years or something, this, this thing is in place. It's very, very new. But you think it's been there always, but it's very new. It wasn't to, to this extent. So it's very, it's very recent. People need to get organized and get their things together, and then start, we'll start probably coming up. That's my, my impression. Thank you, Fre uh, Frederick. Um, We'd like to present you with a gift. Um, it's from one of our sponsors for the session, uh, a very generous com company judging by their livestock procurement practices. Uh, <laughs> the Alliance Group. 
so it's not surprising their generosity has extended to a gift for you here today. We hope you enjoy it. Thank you.